All right. We're, we're, the recording is started. Hey, everyone. Uh, uh, before I actually run through the uh, intro, there are about five or six seats up here and uh, one or two uh, here. If you're feeling shy in the back, you want to come on forward. There is some space. So uh, take a minute now if you want to do that. So, uh, let me get started. Uh, welcome to the 164th monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Tonight we are going to be hearing from Ted So, who will be talking to us about his uh, experiences developing and maintaining the X4 file system, uh, EXT4. I think that's probably all seen in the numbers, but I just wanted to uh, make sure there. Uh, which is currently the default file system on most Linux systems, uh, and is now the default file system shipping with the majority of Android devices on the market. Uh, tonight, before we get started, three quick requests, and we make this every uh, every month. One, please silence your cell phones. Put them on vibrate, but don't don't uh, have them go off uh, during the presentation. Please do not use the coffee makers. Uh, they make a terrible lot of noise. And uh, lastly, when we ask questions, please use the mic uh, or make sure that uh, Ted will uh, repeat your question. It's important so that we have this on tape, and so when people watch it later, they they understand the question and answer. Uh, we'd also like to quickly thank Google for graciously allowing us to use this great space and thank our other sponsors who are uh, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. By the way, you some hurry, it's a brief one. Oh, yeah, please, everyone. Give yourself. Uh, tonight, after, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And our volunteers. We, we wouldn't be able to function without our volunteers who um, put their time into this, as well as the employees of Google who make this space available. Um, it's really important. Tonight, after Ted's talk, we will be giving away some Orion Eagle coupons, as well as a hard copy of the Linux programming interface by No Start Press. Uh, to win, you will need to answer trivia questions that Ted has picked out, and he will be asking them. Uh, the trivia questions will be from his talk, so pay attention. <laughs> when any of the questions come around for trivia, raise your hand, get the mic, and make sure you're called on. We don't want any sour grapes in case people start shouting out their answer. That's not how you win. Um, so if he calls on you, you answer correctly, you get the prize, and we're all really happy for you. Uh, after the meeting, please feel free to join us uh, for more talk and drinks at McKenna's Pub at 250 West 14th Street. We'll have a couple of groups heading over, so don't worry about having to run out early. Um, you'll be led there uh, in groups. Um, a few quick announcements. Our next monthly presentation in February will cover the differences between Python 2 and Python 3. And our March presentation will cover open source private cloud frameworks. Um, one of our workshop coordinators, Rob Menez, uh, would like to say a few quick words in the next workshop. Here you go, Rob. Thank you, Peter. All right, so really quickly, I'd like to announce our first workshop of 2013. We'll be talking about the Raspberry Pi. So if anyone's interested in coming down to the workshop, please see myself, Dave Thurisco, or Greg Levine. We're around, you'll find us. But anyway, hope everyone can join us. Back to you, Peter. All right, thanks. Um, I have an announcement. Uh, for anyone who isn't aware of it, there is a DevOps Day NYC next Thursday and Friday at NYU Power in Brooklyn. Uh, look it up at devopsdays.org if you're interested. And there should be a video of the event afterwards in case you can't make it. Um, does anyone else have any announcements? Please come on up. Oh, that's not going to work. Okay. <laughs> we, we, uh... Uh, Wikipedia Day is February 23rd at uh, ITP, I think. Anyway, uh, we'll send out an announcement to my audience. So it's Wikipedia Day, February 23rd, you said? Yeah. All right. Any other announcements? Um, all right. And with that, let's give a warm welcome to Ted So, uh, who traveled from Massachusetts all the way down, all the way down here. And, uh, you yeah. know. Hi. Uh, thanks uh, for coming here. Uh, it's always great to come back to New York City. I live in Boston, which means, fortunately, it's a pretty easy hop to come down. Uh, I think the last time I talked with NYLOG was a couple of years ago, uh, so it's always good to be back. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the HD4 file system, how it fits in with you know, other file systems uh, within Linux. Uh, and in order to do that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, why file systems are hard. Because uh, people love making file systems, and I think it's great that there are 
uh, over 60 or 70 different file systems in the Linux kernel tree at this point. Um, and one of the amusing things is everyone thinks that file systems will stabilize a lot more quickly than they actually do take to stabilize. We'll talk a bit about that. Uh, then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the history of EXT4, how it got to where it is, uh, some of the new features, uh, some of the advantages, disadvantages of EXT4, uh, and then I'll wrap it up. So that's sort of the general roadmap of where we're going to be going. Um, so yeah, file systems are hard. Let's think about why that's true, because I think it's, it's actually uh, something that's worth uh, people actually uh, remembering. Uh, and let's first talk about it from a more general point of view, which is, you know, what makes software, you know, tricky to make reliable and robust? Well, here's three things that I'll, I'll mention. Premature optimization, right? You make your code complicated. Uh, op ample opportunities to make mistakes. And, you know, the code needs to be fast, it needs to be fast, but there's usually a trade-off associated with that. Uh, internal state is a great way to add, you know, additional complexity and you know, make things really, really hard to debug, and parallelism, right? Another great thing that makes things harder. All right, so what makes file systems hard? Um, well, gee, uh, people like to use file systems for lots of different things, so we're always being asked to optimize for many, many different workloads. Uh, in general, file systems are you know, supposed to be good at everything. I'll talk later about why maybe that isn't such a good thing to aim for, but it is what, uh, of what we traditionally try to do. Uh, file systems, by definition, are supposed to store state, which means we have an awful lot of it. Terabytes, in fact, of state sometimes. Um, and of course, in order to make things fast, um, we have lots and lots of parallelism. Right? Every single process may be accessing the file system at the same time. And at any point in time, any one of those hundreds of processes on that system running on potentially hundreds of cores, if you've got a really, really big Linux machine, um, might be trying to touch the same directory or same file at the same time, which means the parallelism is pretty much the worst case. And that's one of the reasons why file systems are just kind of hard to make ready. Um, so how long does it take to actually make a file system become you know, ready for production enterprise use? Uh, and that was actually a question that uh, I actually tried to answer uh, back in November of 2007. Uh, and what happened was at about that time, um, you know, this was before Sun had imploded, and uh, you know, ZFS was getting a lot of marketing buzz, and so there were a bunch of people uh, within the Linux kernel community, uh, and we actually had people from many different companies. Uh, we had some folks from IBM, uh, which was where I was working at the time. Uh, we had some folks from Red Hat, some folks from Intel, a uh, number of other companies. And we sort of said, well, you know, how do we actually have something that isn't necessarily a replacement for ZFS, but at least had some of those cool, exciting features that everyone seemed to be, you know, lusting after? Uh, and as part of that, it was like, okay, well, suppose we need to make a file system from scratch. How hard could it be? Um, and so I actually asked people who had done it before, right? So AIX had a couple of people, uh, teams that had made file systems. Uh, we took a look and saw how much effort Sun had put into making ZFS. You know, hit dozens of people for seven years before they actually uh, released ZFS, and then it took a couple of years after that before anyone really trusted it. Um, you know. Uh, at uh, Digital, uh, the ADVFS was another file system that had been around. Uh, and the answer that we got back um, was between 100 to 200 person years worth of effort. Uh, and, you know, because of Brooks Law, you can't just put 200 people on a project. Five to seven calendar years of real time uh, before the file system is enterprise ready. Uh, and some would actually say those are minimum numbers. Uh, right? Again, look at, think about ZFS. ZFS took seven years before it was actually announced by Sun. Uh, and I don't think anyone seriously used it in you know, a mission-critical system for a couple of years after that. And that's just kind of the reality. Right? And file systems are hard. Um, it takes a while. And uh, you know, when we uh, actually talked about that, uh, you know, 
there was a debate inside uh, the uh, uh, task force. It was called NGFS, for Next Generation File System Task Force. Um, and you know, we were supposed to report back to our corporate masters at Red Hat and IBM and Intel. Uh, and there was a debate about whether or not we should put this data in the final report that would go out to the managers. Uh, and everyone said, no, don't put it in there. Uh, there were one or two people who said, it's open source, it'll be different. Uh, and, but the main strongest argument was, if we tell the managers it's going to take that long, they won't fund the project. So we didn't put it in there. Uh, and there were people who said, oh, you know, ButterFS will be production ready in three years. Uh, that was back in 2007. Uh, and, you know, Sousa is only now, in 2012, talking about putting ButterFS uh, in SUSE Enterprise Linux sometime this coming year. And again, we'll see how long before uh, system administrators actually trust it in mission critical systems. But, you know, I think if we actually take a look at the prediction, it's actually about, about right, right? And this is what it takes. And, and so one of the reasons why I bring that up is uh, Samsung has come out with this really, really cool file system. I'm really, really glad they did it. It's called F2FS. It's a flash optimized file system uh, that is designed for potential use in uh, Android type devices or handheld devices where we're using uh, EMMC flash. And we'll talk a little bit more about EMMC flash. But basically, uh, when you're trying to drive the cost of the bill of materials um, for a cell phone down to the minimal possible level, you end up with really, really crappy storage devices. Uh, and the trick is, how do you work around the fact that you know, we're penny pitching at the hardware level? Um, and so I, I think it's really, really good that they're doing that. Uh, and they didn't believe me either when I told them, look, it's going to take you a couple of years before people really trust it. But you know, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't do it. I'm actually very, very glad they did it, because it's actually exposed lots of really, really cool ideas. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things. So. Let's set the Wayback Machine, go back to 1991, uh, when Linus first released Linux. Uh, and the first file system that we actually had uh, in the Linux kernel tree was the Minix file system. Uh, and that was kind of important because the Minix user space was what we used to actually bootstrap Linux, uh, the Linux kernel way back then. Uh, unfortunately, it had a couple of uh, tiny limitations. Uh, depending on how you formatted the file system, it had a hard limit of either 14 or 32 characters uh, because directory entries were either a fixed length 16 bytes or 32 bytes with two bytes for the item number. Um, and we were limited to 64 megabytes uh, was the maximum file size. That's okay, hard drives didn't get that big back then. Um, but you know, these were constraints that were kind of annoying. Uh, and a year later, we had the first uh, attempt at uh, extension to the Minix file system. So it was called the extended file system. Uh, and it, we now allowed a princely <coughs> two gigabyte file systems and up to 255 byte file names. So we actually had variable length file names in the directory entries. Uh, it had a couple of shortcomings. Uh, one was it used a linked list for free blocks, um, which meant you know, whatever block you freed was the next block that you would actually use, um, which meant the disk would get horribly fragmented because you really couldn't make intelligent block allocation decisions. Uh, and like the Minix file system, there was only one timestamp, right? So there wasn't any A time, C time, and M time. There was just one timestamp in the iNode. Uh, there was another file system called ZFS, which was another attempt to slightly extend the Minix file system. Uh, for a variety of reasons, it never actually won out. So uh, the extended file system became the uh, file system that people gradually migrated over um, because the Minix file system was just too constraining. A um, <clears throat> year later, we were running up against the limitations of the extended file system, uh, and we came up with the extended two file system. Uh, and at this point, this is the file system that actually starts to look a whole lot like what ext3 and ext4 would look like. And that's because by the time we got to ext2, we kind of figured out that file systems were these things where you want to add new features. Um, and so there was some explicit design decisions made 
um, where we could easily add new features to the file system while remaining uh, format uh, compatible. So as much as possible, we try to provide both backwards and forward compatibility uh, in the file system. And so the EXT2 file system is the first file system where um, we actually designed that in so that when people went to EXT3 and later EXT4, you didn't have to do a backup, reformat, and restore to upgrade file systems. Um, and so that's probably one of the biggest things about the EXT2 file system. Um, we now have up to two terabyte files, 32 terabyte file systems. Uh, we basically took the idea of cylinder groups from the BSD fast file system. We called them block groups because by then it was really obvious that cylinders were a figment of the disk drive's imagination. So you might as well be honest and call them block groups because they had absolutely nothing to do with the physical layout uh, on the disk. Um, and so that was, in fact, uh, you know, sort of the beginning of what was actually a very, very stable file system. Uh, and was, as you will see, um, the ext 2 file system didn't really change for a couple of years after that, because it was good enough, right? I mean, basically, um, it was essentially feature identical um, with uh, the BSD fast file system at that point. Uh, I actually started getting involved with the ext file system about two years later in 1995. Uh, and I got involved originally because I was kind of sick and tired of FSCK taking so long. Now, people kind of complained that, you know, E2FSCK on EXT2 file systems took a while. Um, but back then, they took about 10 times longer. Uh, and the reason for that was we were using a file system that Linus Torvalds had written originally for the Minix file system and kind of massaged it to work um, with, EXT, with the EXT file system and the EXT2 file system. Um, and it was kind of written in a very haphazard way, right? Linus just needed something that would make sure that the file system was okay, recover from hardware problems, but directories would end up getting read two or three times, inodes would get read multiple times, uh, and so there was a lot of wasted um, uh, disk reads uh, in that early version of FSCK. Um, and so I got sick and tired of that, and I basically rewrote it from scratch. Um, I had a general purpose library called libdxt2fs, um, which has since been used for lots of different utilities. So uh, there are ext fuse implementations that get used for um, Windows and Macintosh users to access the ext2 file system. They go through the uh, libdxt2fs. Um, and as a generic interface, I was actually, I spent a lot of time designing the abstractions for that library. Um, E2FS Progs was also, and, and, and that's, as far as I know, it still is the only file system I know of which actually has a regression test suite. Um, you know, I'm not aware of any other file systems out there. They may exist, you know, but you know, maybe they're proprietary, or maybe no one's just told me about it yet. But none of the other file systems have a systematic regression test suite. Right? And that's just one of those things where if you're going to start from scratch, it's a whole lot easier to put in good engineering practices from the very beginning. Right? And you, know, you just have the discipline. Someone reports a bug, you create a 100K file system that demonstrates the bug, then you fix the bug, and then you see that the test file system actually no longer exhibits the bug, and then you put it in the source tree. Right? Now, you know, that was just a discipline that we got in very early. Um, and so I actually continue to think that uh, E2FS progs, and I'm kind of biased because it's my baby, um, but it remains one of the really core um, strengths of the ext2, ext3, ext4 file systems because we have that powerful package, a good library, lots of good tools around it, and that's something a lot of people forget about, that it's not just the kernel piece, it's also the utilities that surround the file system because that's a critical piece of what people need to actually use the file system uh, in the real world. So, as I said, it was actually a while before we came out with ext3. We sort of indicated that, you know, the people who did ext2, Remy Carr, uh, and, uh, was basically the primary file system author at that time. He actually got a lot of things right. Uh, so it was in, uh, you know, the early uh, 2000s. This is about the time when Linux started getting a lot of attention. Uh, you know, I think the, you know, there was a Forbes article and a Fortune article. Uh, you know, IBM was starting to 
think about Linux on the inside. Um, and journaling started becoming the feature that everyone actually wanted. Um, so the XP3 uh, file system was first made the Linux tree in November of 2001. Uh, it technically was not the first file system with journaling. Um, that honor actually goes to RiserFS, which entered the Linux kernel tree in January of that year. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't really stable, so no one actually trusted it um, until November. So I kind of call it a tie. Um, you know, uh, Stephen Tweedy, who was the person who actually worked on the EXP3 file system uh, in a previous life, was actually the cluster file system designer for uh, VMS. Uh, so he was, you know, kind of anal about not releasing code until he was fairly sure it wasn't eating anyone's data. Uh, so he actually didn't release it, and when he released it, uh, what he did was, well, this is, you know, enough scary code that instead of just simply patching ext2, we'll rename everything from ext2 to ext3, um, and so you could actually run with the journal or without the journal, um, and we actually had two versions of the code base um, in, uh, in the kernel. And so depending on how you talk about it, ext2 and ext3, you can actually think of them as the same file system, right? We use the same utilities. E2FS Prox handles ext2 and ext3 file systems. It's just that we have two versions of that implementation, of that file system driver in the kernel. One that happens to be called ext2, and another that happens to be called ext3 in the tree at the same time. Um, and when we get to ext4, it becomes even more so. Um, and so whether you call it one file systems or two file systems, it's as shorthand, it's a lot easier to say, okay, this is a file system that I created with the journal feature enabled, right? And it's a lot easier just to say it's an ext3 file system. But, you know, there's not actually a whole lot of difference between the two. Uh, the key features that were added to ext3 initially was just the journaling. Later on, um, we added access control list and extended attributes. Um, those two features actually got backported into ext2. Um, I think they did. I'm pretty sure they did because SE Linux and a couple of other tools actually really needed it. Um, so they, they backported that stuff in because, you know, for a while there were some people who still wanted to use uh, ext2 for root file systems or, you know, other crazy things. I don't know. Um, hash B trees came uh, later. That was one of the last features that we added to ext3. Uh, and that basically uh, gave you fast directory lookups because um, we use them for directories. Uh, and one of the really important things about ext3 was that if you unmounted the file system cleanly, we actually had two feature flags. There's one feature flag that says we have a journal, and the journal was just simply an inode. And so, therefore, that was marked as a compatible file system feature. And a compatible file system feature is a feature that if the implementation in the kernel doesn't know about it, it's okay to actually mount the file system. Which means you can take an ext3 file system as long as it was cleanly unmounted, and you can mount it on ext2. Right? Now, the ext2 file system never actually got hash B tree, so if you actually enabled the hashed um, B tree directories, then that would actually stop you from mounting it on ext2. But if you just simply created a bare bones ext2 file system added the journal, you would actually mount it on either, either ext2 or ext3. Now, if the journal needed to be replayed before it was safe to mount, that bit was actually set in what was called an incompatible feature flag. And the incompatible feature flag means if the kernel doesn't know about this bit, refuse to mount it. And that's how we made it safe against having that file system mounted on ext2, because ext2 wouldn't know how to recover the journal. Um, and that's part of what some of the features that we use to actually be able to add file system features to ext3 and then later ext4 in a completely backwards compatible manner. Right? And with ext4, you'll see there's this huge long list of features. Um, but in fact, you don't actually have to enable them all. Right? This actually makes our testing matrix a little complicated. Um, but for system administrators, it means that you can actually take an ext3 file system and mount it as an ext3 file system using ext4, and you will get some speed improvements, 
And if you don't like it, you can unmount it, remount it under EXP3, and it works fine. Later on, you can add the features that you know, make things even faster. And of course, once you add those features that EXP3 doesn't understand, you won't be able to go back. But it's up to you to decide when you want to add those features, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, so 2006 is when we actually started the EXP4 work plan. Uh, some of the pieces that actually would end up going into EXP4 um, had actually been previously written um, by Lustre, um, uh, or ClusterFS, who did the Lustre file system, uh, as, early as, as, as early as 2003. So the extent feature, which we used to replace the indirect block mechanism for mapping logical blocks to physical block, was actually code that was contributed um, by, uh, by ClusterFS uh, and they had originally just simply distributed patches against EXP3 that added extents as this optional feature to speed up um, the Lustre file system. Uh, and so when we actually started EXP4, we actually had that code you know, sitting there as patches, like, great, that's the first feature that we'll actually import, and we'll call it EXP4. Um, but the other thing that we, at that point, were starting to really run into was the 32 terabyte file system limit. Um, and so, at that point, that meant that we actually had to take all the 32-bit block numbers and make them 64-bit block numbers, uh, and that was actually a very, very radical change to the code base, right? You had to touch an awful lot of code. Um, and so, for that reason, we decided, okay, let's fork the ext3 code base, make a copy of it, do a global search and replace on ext3 to ext4, and so now we basically had another copy of the you know, ext2, ext3, ext4 file system kernel, which we could now pack on and add new features. Um, and so those were the first two features that we actually had. Uh, later on, we actually started adding more features, but those features were ones where we could actually very easily control the code that we would actually touch. And so it, was, it wasn't worth it to make another copy of the code base and go from ext4 to ext5. Um, and so what we do instead is when we add a new feature, it's protected by a new feature flag. And unless you actually make fs the file system with that feature flag, you never actually touch the new code path. So that allows us to add all sorts of interesting new features. Um, and people who are using the default file systems won't see any of it. So we don't have to worry about, you know, introducing a problem that might wipe out a lot of people's data, right? Now, people who want to use it can explicitly enable that feature by using tune to fs to set that feature flag, but it's something you actually have to do, right? It's not something that magically happens when you go to a new kernel version. Now, at the time, when we started doing this uh, ext4 work, as, as I said, you know, we, we made the announcement that we were going to do this uh, in the middle of 2006. Um, we actually did a lot of work uh, behind the scenes, and uh, the first version of the ext4 code base didn't actually appear in a kernel source tree until early 2008. Uh, and as you will recall, in late 2007, we were doing, having these next generation file system uh, meetings. Uh, and I was involved, other ext4 developers were involved, uh, Chris Mason, who you know, would later do the ButterFS work, uh, had already started doing some of the work that would become ButterFS. Um, and so at the time, uh, the, the plan that we had was, well, we knew that ButterFS would actually take a while, right? Chris thought, you know, if you could get something done in three years, I was thinking it would be more like five to seven. Um, but in the meantime, there were all of these problems with the ext3 file system that you could actually see, right? If you were going to put uh, ext3 <coughs> Linux running with ext3 head to head with some of the other commercial Unix systems that were out there, you would hit problems, right? 32 terabytes, even back then, was starting to become a real limitation. So it was like, well, let's make ext4 the short-term short band-aid um, that would fix the most glaring problems, but we didn't <coughs> try to do anything really scary. Um, because the whole point is, the ext3 code base is well tested. Right? And so we want to add new features, but we also didn't want to make it you know, go so crazy that it completely destabilized the tree. 
Um, and so that was the original plan, was that EXP4 would be a relatively short-term thing, uh, and then ButterFS would become the grand new future. Uh, I think one of the things that has happened is, as we started adding new features to EXP4, I think we learned a bit more about some of the performance characteristics of EXP4, and that there were certain niches where EXP4 was actually a better solution. Um, and that's okay, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and so now it's like, well, we'll just keep working on ext4 as long as it's fun to work on. Uh, if there are people who want to use the ext4 file system, that's great. Um, and you know, some of those people will, you know, either hire uh, the ext4 development community, or they may join the ext4 development community. Um, and that's one of the ways that it ended up that uh, uh, Android ended up using uh, uh, ext4. And that was the interesting thing about that was I wasn't even involved in that decision. You know, it was just, you know, at some point I became aware that the Android team had chosen ext4 and was using it. Uh, not like they asked me before they did it. You know, I was kind of glad they did, but you know, it wasn't like I, it was something that I lobbied for. Um, so, what are some of the new features in ext4? This is slide one of two. Uh, so. The new limits now are uh, 16 terabyte files uh, and up to one exabyte file systems. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later that that's a theoretical maximum. There's some practical limitations you'll probably run into before you get to that, um, particularly around rate awareness. It's a known problem, something we want to fix. Um, but you know, in terms of the format, you can in theory make a one exabyte file system. Whether or not you'd be happy using it, that's a different question. Um, as I already mentioned, we're using extents instead of indirect blocks. Um, we also do something called delayed allocation, which means when you first write um, to a, a write a file using ext4, we don't decide where on disk it will actually go. So we will we basically are doing lazy evaluation. We wait until the last possible minute, right? Either when the write back daemon says, "Okay, it's time to actually write this to disk," or if your application does an f sync. At only then do we actually figure out where on disk it's going to actually go. Right? And at that point, we have a lot more information, like how big the file is so far. Uh, and that allows us to make uh, more intelligent uh, decisions. It also means that if you have a file which you create, write a bunch of stuff, and then you immediately delete it, if you do it quickly enough, it may never hit disk. And that's kind of cool. Um, we have some. We have f allocate. Um, this allows you to allocate blocks in advance um, without actually having to zero them, right? So what happens is we actually can mark in the extent the fact that these blocks are uninitialized, um, and so you know the blocks are there. They're guaranteed that uh, you know that the writes will succeed, um, but you don't have to pre-zero them. Uh, and the original reason for this was for digital video recorders wanted this feature um, because. If you're going to record a one-hour TV show that requires about one gigabyte of disk, um, and you want that space to be contiguous, but funny thing about a one-hour TV show, you're going to write that one gigabyte over the space of the hour, right? And if you want to keep it uh, contiguous, it's a lot easier to do that if you tell the file system up front, reserve that one gig of memory, right? To this day, with ext4, and in general, most file systems, if you know how big the file is as you start writing it, um, there is an advantage to telling the file system up front as soon as you create it with f allocate and then write into it. Because uh, then the file system can do a better job. Right? With delayed allocation, we try to do the same thing by just simply keeping that in memory until we actually need to write it out. But for a sufficiently large file that's bigger than how much memory you have, we're going to end up having to make allocation decisions before we know how big the file is. And so if you're going to be writing big files, F allocate, and you know how big it is in advance, F allocate will actually allow the file system to do a better job. Uh, Sub-second uh, timestamps. Uh, basically, computers have gotten fast enough that you could actually run the C compiler in under a second. Um, maybe not a C++ compile, but C definitely. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, if you want to make not to get confused, sub-second timestamps became a good thing. Uh, we added space in the inode for uh, NFSV4 version IDs, and that was needed so NFSV4 could do more intelligent caching on the client side. 
Uh, exe2 <coughs> and exe3 had this really stupid limit of 32,000 subdirectories. Um, and we basically busted that limit so you can actually have more directories than that. Um, the metadata layout uh, can be flexible. There's a default file system layout for ext3 where the inode table and the block allocation bitmaps are in each individual block group. Uh, and there's some good reasons for that. It you know, makes your metadata a little bit more resilient. If you lose one part of the disk, you won't lose the metadata that's mostly for the data on that part of the disk. Um, but it makes certain things much more slow, like FSCK, because you have to seek all over the place. Uh, it also turns out that if you're going to be dealing with EMMC devices, uh, EMMC devices are sometimes will use the first part of the flash uh, with SLC, because that's where the fat file system table would live if you're using a digital camera. Um, and these days, MLC uh, flash uh, the number of write cycles has dropped down to, in some cases, 3,000 to 5,000 5, 5, write cycles. Um, as you decrease the feature size with Flash, the number of write cycles that you can do uh, gets less and less. Um, and the problem with the FAT file system is the FAT tables get updated all the time. And so what some MMC devices and SD cards would actually do is the first part of the disk would use SLC, so the file system metadata um, would be you know, on the more robust portion of the flash. And with ext4, one of the things that you can do is you can actually format the file system so we put all the file system metadata at the beginning of the disk. Because uh, you know, we don't care about seek times so with flash, and if it, that happens to be where the SLC is, that's actually something that we can accommodate. Uh, so that's one of the things I've been you know, walking around telling uh, some of the mobile handset manufacturers, oh, by the way, if you're buying flash that has this property, you know, there are things we can do to actually make uh, ext4 uh, much more intelligent. A lot of these features uh, combined actually uh, cause FSCK for uh, uh, ext4 file systems to get significantly faster. Um, typically, uh, a factor of uh, 7 to 12, right? I've seen file systems that would used to take 45 uh, minutes to FSCK. Same size, same rough distribution of uh, files. With ext4, it's about four to five minutes. Um, and you know that's assuming that you've actually done a freshly FSCK, um, sorry, freshly makeafest file system with ext4 on it. Uh, if you take an ext3 file system to convert in place, it'll be a bit faster, but you're not going to see that spectacular improvement uh, in FSCK times. Uh, more features with ext4. Uh, modern disks now have trim, sometimes known as discard. Uh, SSDs have this. Basically, once you delete space, if you tell the flash, the flash device that we're not using those blocks anymore, then it helps the SSD do a better garbage collection. So the flash translation layer uh, can make the disk much more, uh, much more efficient if it knows that we don't care about the contents of these blocks. Uh, of course, if you use discard, it means undelete won't work because the flash layer has been told, we don't care about these blocks. Um, but it can make a really, really huge difference in your random write performance of SSDs after you actually discard all the unused blocks uh, in a file system. Uh, the punch system call allows you to deallocate blocks in the middle of a file. Uh, and the main interest in this is with virtualization. Okay, so if you are virtualizing um, uh, you know, using KVM or uh, you know, pick your favorite uh, VM, VMware, what have you. Um, what you might want to do is in the guest operating system, when you delete uh, files, you would use the trim command to tell the hypervisor we don't care about those blocks, and then the hypervisor on the host OS would use the punch system call to deallocate those blocks from the disk image that you're using for the VM so that those disk blocks get freed and can potentially be used by other disk images um, on the VM, right? So if you're going to have, you know, 30, 50 VMs running on one big machine, all with disk images, you would use trim or discard on the guest OS and punch on the host OS. And so that's a nice combination. Uh, a similar thing is, if, if you're going to be punching all sorts of holes in your disk image, you want to be able to copy these disk images very, very efficiently. 
Uh, and so there's a feature that we've just added to ext4, seek whole and seek data, um, which allows the copy command uh, to, when it actually detects a whole, skip the un unallocated blocks, uh, and then it'll do a seek data, um, it'll do a seek whole to actually find the end of the next set of data blocks. So you only have to copy the data blocks and skip the holes. Uh, and so seek whole, seek data was actually an interface that Sun had created for Solaris, um, and Linux has basically adopted it, and at this point, all the major file systems, whether it's ButterFS, XFS, uh, now very recently exe4, have seek whole and seek data support. And again, useful for virtualization, because we actually do have a number of uh, exe4 users that are very interested in using that uh, in cloud, uh, cloud servers. Uh, no journal mode, uh, that was actually one of the first features that Google uh, uh, donated to ext4. It's actually how I ended up at Google, is I discovered that they were doing something with uh, ext4. Uh, and it turns out that if you're using a cluster file system and you don't particularly care about the robustness of a particular uh, disk, because after all you've got multiple copies of that data uh, on different machines so you can survive an entire machine or maybe an entire rack dying, right? You know, maybe the entry switch on the rack dies, right? And so uh, a lot of this is in the GFS paper that Google has published. Um, and so what it means is you're going to be doing all sorts of robustness at the cluster file system level. You don't really need to pay the cost of the journal at the local disk file system level. Um, and what, what the issue was, was that uh, my manager, Mike Rubin, said, you know, I want all these really cool features that are in ext4, like delayed allocation, um, like extents instead of indirects, and uh, I want to be able to use that without the journal. Uh, and the fact uh, that, you know, Google really didn't want to use the journal is why Google had never actually moved to ext3. It had been on ext2 for like, you know, years and years and years, even though everybody else was on ext3. Uh, and so we actually moved from ext2 to ext4, because with ext4 we could get all the advanced features of things like extents, and do that without the journal. So the journal is optional in ext4. This also means that ext4 um, is the first file system that can basically be a drop-in replacement for both ext2 and ext3. Because uh, with ext3, you actually had to have the journal. It, it didn't have a way of operating without the journal. Um, and there are a number of file systems, uh, Fedora, a uh, number of distributions. Uh, Fedora is the first. I believe Fedora 18 is going to do this. They're actually going to be shipping only with ext4. And if you mount with, you know, dash t ext2 or mount dash t ext3, it will actually really be using ext4 under the covers. Um, and that just simply means it's just one less code base that they have to worry about. Because we've actually had problems where we'll fix a bug in ext4, and sometimes people forget to backport it into the ext3 and ext2 code bases. Uh, and we found bugs in ext4 that, when we looked back later, had been in ext3 um, and had been there for over a decade that no one had noticed. Uh, and one of, the thing, one of the reasons for that was you know, it would happen very, very rarely, and when it happened, people would say, oh, must be a cosmic ray, must be a hardware problem, because they can never make them use it. Um, one of the things that would happen was when we were using ext4 at Google scale, it meant that a problem that would only happen once in the blue moon would be happening 10 or 12 times a day. Uh, and so we actually found the problem, and then, you know, we fixed it in ext4, and we looked like, oh, same problem was in ext3 went through multiple RHEL enterprise certifications. No one had noticed. Um, but you know, we found it, we fixed it, and then we backported it in dxt3. Um, and, but that's one of the things I talk about, how it's really hard to get file systems right. right? If you want it to be dead solid reliable, there is no, uh, you know, no substitute for using it for a long period of time, and then as you find the bugs, you fix them. Uh, one of the new features that will be coming soon is metadata checksums, so that if the metadata is corrupted, we'll know that it's corrupted, uh, and then we'll, we'll take appropriate action. Uh, one of the things I hope to be able to do soon is this feature that's very, very similar to what ButterFS has, um, where 
if you're using a RAID 1 file system, uh, a RAID 1 storage device, and we notice a metadata uh, corruption, we'll immediately go and try to get the other copy from the other RAID 1 mirror and see if that one is okay, right? And so we're gonna you know, try to get that same features and just simply rely on the RAID uh, logical block uh, layer. And the same thing with uh, snapshots, right? You could do snapshots using LVM. Uh, and so what we're gonna do is for some of these features, we'll just simply rely on the block layer to provide features that ButterFS is gonna try to do inside the file system. Uh, and inline data, this is basically so that if you have a very, very small file, that you can actually stuff it into the iNode. Um, and uh, this was actually contributed uh, from some folks at Taobao, uh, which is the Chinese equivalent of Amazon and eBay. Um, they've actually been a fairly uh, major contributor to EXT4. They've been doing lots of you know, interesting code, um, code contributions. They participate in our weekly conference calls. Uh, you know, they're helping out with code reviews. Um, you know, in general, we review the code before it goes in, so it's really cool that they're, they're, they've been helping out. So, what are the advantages of ext 4 Well, you've probably heard me talk about some of these already. Um, and I like to think that the reason why I like ext 4 it's one of the reasons why I still work on it, is that it's a modern file system. It has things like delayed allocations, extents, uh, B trees for your directories. It's still reasonably simple. Um, now, lines of code is always kind of a squishy uh, uh, measure of complexity, uh, but if you want to just sort of take a relative sense, you can see that you know with Minix it was about you know two and a half thousand lines of code, you know ext two was you know a you know factor of four, ext three sort of doubled that, uh, ext four kind of doubled that, ButterFS is another doubling, uh, and XFS is like close to 100k. So it gives you a sense of you know, the complication of the code base. Uh, the other thing is, as I've already said, portions of the code base are you know, time tested. Uh, and this is both user space utilities as well as the journal block layer. Um, we had to make it 64-bit clean, so there's now JBD2, but fundamentally the code hasn't changed. We just sort of doubled all the WIS. Um, the journal block layer, as it turns out, is also used by OCFS2. Um, which is Oracle's cluster file system, right? So we actually, that's code reuse that's happening. So we've got, you know, multiple users of that same code base. Um, and it's just sort of a different philosophy. We believe in doing incremental development uh, instead of rip and replace, right? Which is the approach that ButterFS uses. Both are perfectly good approaches and, you know, we'll see how things work. But, you know, what it's allowed us to do is, you know, we're continuing to add new features. You know, metadata checksums is, uh, you know, not yet on by default, but a lot of the code is there. And, you know, we'll do lots of testing and only when it's ready will we start enabling it as a default feature that it gets uh, created when you uh, create the file system. Um, and, of course, very well understood performance characteristics, both good and bad. Um, but, you know, as it turns out, as we'll see in a little bit, that's actually something you need to worry about. Um, now, that being said, there are all sorts of disadvantages, right? Um, there are certain fundamental design decisions that were made back in the early 90s, right, a decade ago, um, that are, you know, you can't really change. Um, two decades ago, yeah. Um, who's counting? Uh, things like a fixed inode table, right? You know, when you format the file system, the number of inodes that you want to use is pretty much fixed in stone, so you can't, you can't really change that. Uh, the fact that we're using um, uh, bitmaps for our block allocations and inode allocations, again, fairly fundamental. There are some downsides if you're going to be creating really, really big files. You can end up spending a lot of time doing bitmap work. Okay, fine, right? I mean, if you're going to be creating lots and lots of really, really big files, or you're going to be using really, really big RAID arrays, you should just use XFS, right? It's, it's been optimized for that. They're, they're going to, you know, in benchmarks where you're doing large files on really large data systems, they will clean everybody's clock because they had a performance team in Australia that was constantly doing performance measurements on those large systems for years on end, doing, doing lots of tuning. So, you know, they got that market. Great. They can have it, you know, we're not going to beat them on that. Um, but there's a lot of things where, you know, bitmap based allocations, good enough, right? A lot of cases, certainly for a cell phone, we're not going to be worried about X byte file systems. 
um, and 32-bit inodes. Again, not an issue unless you're going to be talking about really, really big rate arrays, um, and that's going to be uh, a problem anyway, right? Right now, rate support is really, really weak. Um, we actually do have a place where we mark the rate geometry in the file system, so we could make use of it. Uh, right now, unless you're using Luster, uh, because Luster basically bypasses the POSIX interfaces when it's creating um, objects, um, we're completely RAID oblivious. We're not actually taking advantage of the RAID geometry uh, for doing block allocation or block write-back decisions. Uh, it's something I want to change. It's not something that uh, my day job particularly cares about. Um, and so it's one of these things that's been kind of happening in the background. Uh, it turns out that RAID support may also be useful for improving performance on EMMC flash. Uh, because it turns out EMMC flash has these huge erase blocks that if you squint at them and look at them a little funny, kind of look like RAID stripes. Whereas you, you want to write in chunks of an erase block, which is kind of what you want to do with RAID stripes. So we're probably going to actually add RAID stripe support just simply because it's going to make life better um, for EMMC devices. Um, and yeah, there are all sorts of sexy new features like compression, like file system level uh, snapshots uh, that we're just simply never going to add. Uh, if you want them, there are other places in the storage stack where you can do them. Uh, you know, the device mapper will allow you to do uh, thin provision snapshots that actually have a lot of the same features as file system level snapshots. If you're going to be doing huge numbers of file system snapshots, like you know, hundreds a day, Butterfest will probably be faster. Uh, if your workload is you just simply need to do snapshots every single time you want to back up your database, you know, LVM style snapshots or thin provisioning snapshots will be good enough. Um, and so these are areas where, you know, it's just DXD4 is not optimized for it. And, you know, if you ask me, you know, I'm going to be doing this workload and it has these characteristics, sometimes I'm not going to tell you DXD4 is the file system you should use, right? You know, you should use the right file system for the right job. Um, so at least for today, what are the common uh, EXT4 use cases? Uh, at least for now, it's still delete uh, default file systems um, for desktops and sort of small servers. You know, so if you have your you know, 1U, 2U rack mount server that's running a web server, very often it's going to be using you know, EXT4, perhaps EXT3 if you're using an old enough RHEL distribution as the default. Um, and for a lot of things, it's perfectly good enough as a general purpose default file system. There's been some talk that some distributions um, you know, might change that in the future. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been hearing that you know, file systems have been thinking about making ButterFS the default. Uh, they haven't been willing to do that quite yet, but you know, again, we may see that. Uh, some of the distros may do that because they figure that's the only way that they'll get the adequate testing they need to make ButterFS enterprise ready, right? So they basically use their community distro users as the guinea pigs. Um, but you know, you guys knew that that's what they were doing, right? I mean, they've never made that a secret. Um, that's you know, that's part of Red Hat's reason for subsidizing Fedora is that way they can actually test the next generation, you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Uh, as people mentioned uh, at, in the intro, Android devices, uh, starting with Honeycomb, started using ext4. Um, basically, they needed something that was uh, more performant than the FAT file system. Uh, and since with these newer Android devices, they weren't exposing the block device um, via the USB port, um, you might as well use a better file system. Uh, turns out, you know, a lot of people are upset that the new Android devices don't actually export um, the internal storage as a FAT device. The reason why they don't do that is in order to do that, they had to unmount the file system so that you could actually mount it under Linux or Mac or Windows or what have you. Um, and the problem is if you did that, anything that was actually relying on what was on the SD card wouldn't be allowed to run. Um, and that really got kind of awful. They said, you know, we just don't want to do that. Um, so they don't allow that anymore. They're using, um, you know, basically a software uh, exchange as the way that you upload or download to it. Um, Linux is finally actually getting um, support for that uh, if you're using a new enough distro, but, you know, it's been kind of slow and painful, but there actually were good reasons for doing that. 
Um, and then the last one is uh, cloud storage servers. Uh, one of the reasons why Taobao uh, was using ext 4 turned out to be very, very similar reasons to um, why uh, the manager that hired me into Google decided to use ext 4 um, which is no journal mode and the fact that it actually performs gracefully uh, when your memory and CPU is tight. And it turns out that many file system uh, developers don't bother benchmarking their file system uh, when there's anything else running on the system, right? So the benchmark gets done when you have vast quantities of memory, vast quantities of CPU, the system is doing nothing but running your benchmark. And that's great, except that's not actually how you use file systems in real life, right? Particularly if you're doing virtualization. Uh, if you take a look at Amazon EC2, right, what's the most expensive thing that, uh, on that? It's memory, right? If you, you know, a tiny Amazon instance is actually relatively cheap, but if you want one that has lots of memory, it gets very, very expensive. Why is that? Because you only have so many DIMM slots, and high density uh, DIMMs are actually very, very expensive. So memory ends up being your bottleneck. Um, and so making a file system that works well uh, when memory is tight is actually kind of interesting, and ext 4 happened to actually do relatively well. Because um, if you have restricted memory, it means you get less caching, um, which means you know, your data blocks aren't going to be in your page cache very long, because restricted memory, they just get evicted out. Uh, more critically is your metadata blocks end up getting evicted out, which means when you need to actually read or write to a file, you might need to bring in the metadata. Um, and so, at least with ext4, one of the, our big problems was the block allocation bit maps, right? And when those got pushed out, then block allocations or, you know, just simply releasing blocks when you uh, unlink or truncate a file um, could actually end up causing long times because we had to pull in all the metadata blocks. Uh, and we actually uh, developed patches to fix that, uh, where we would actually cache um, the not just simply how many blocks were freed on that um, block group, but the largest available extent that was on that particular block group. So when we do an allocation, um, we knew right away whether or not we could skip a block group. Uh, and that actually made a huge difference in, in performance when you're running in a restricted memory configuration. But these are the things that you only discover when you actually benchmark and run in a tight memory situation. Uh, it turns out memory can be a, a CPU can be a problem too, uh, especially if you're using super fast flash, because uh, uh, at that point you know you can now do lots of IOPS, and very often you will end up being CPU bound. Um, also, you might have other uses for the CPU other than you know just simply running your file system, right? Actually running VM jobs, or maybe you're transcoding video. Um, and of course, there were the large-scale traditional database uh, benchmarks, such as TPCC, which actually end up being very, very CPU-sensitive as well as storage-sensitive, right? So if you're you're constricted on the mem on the CPU, you will actually see that in the TPCC results. Um, so this may be a little bit unfair, but uh, it's not me who said this. Is actually something that I got from uh, an Open Solaris uh, mailing list. Um, and uh, I had heard rumors that it was bad, but, you know, uh, at least from this guy, his recommendation was, yeah, you know, you don't care about whether or not your machine is going to be, you know, reliable and, you know, maybe it doesn't only crashes every couple of days or you're rebooting it every couple of days. You know, two gigs of memory is okay. Um, but if you're on a server, you want at least four gigs, preferably eight gigs. And then this is the part that actually made me fall off the chair when I first read it. Plus whatever memory that was needed by your applications. I was like, well, okey I guess I'm not going to be running this on an Amazon instance, am I? Um, and, you know, it just goes to show, right? I mean, if you have lots of memory, it might be a great file system. Uh, but one of the traditional problems you have with copy-on-write file system is that your metadata ends up getting very, very fragmented across the disk, right? And if you're in a restricted memory situation, then when you actually need to read in that metadata, you may end up seeking all over the place. I actually believe this is one of the reasons why Sun really, really pushed using the L2 arc flash cache, because uh, that helped hide that particular performance issue, which is a perfectly good solution, but it you know, ends up pointing out that you know, there may be very interesting performance curves 
Uh, and so one of the things I always tell people is don't believe file system benchmarks. Run your own benchmarks, and the best benchmark is your workload. Um, because every single workload will be a little bit different in terms of the amount of memory and CPU it needs, the actual access patterns, and those access patterns can make all the difference in the world in terms of you know, how benchmarks actually um, play out in real life. Uh, so let me make a few uh, concluding remarks. Um, and the first is, you know, there's been this traditionally this thing about the general purpose file system. That there should be one file system to rule them all, should be good for all possible workloads, you know, the Highlander. Um, and so why is that? Well, you know, the original reason was, well, it's too hard for users to choose, right? Everyone's going to use the default file system, so the default file system should be good for everything. Um, and the other reason was, it used to be that file systems would actually get used for multiple workloads at the same time, because you would have a single big time sharing machine, or a single big server, and you'd be running lots of different applications on that one machine, so ideally the file system should be good for databases, and for this workload, and that workload, because they'd all be running on the same machine. These days, it's probably rare that you will have someone running their web server, their mail server, and their database server on the same piece of iron. Right? So, you know, maybe that doesn't actually really apply anymore. Um, and the thing is, is that because every single workload is different, every single time you make a design choice as a file system developer, you're essentially trading off one design consideration for another. Uh, and if you're trying to optimize for everything, you may very well end up not necessarily being the best at any one thing. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm actually really glad that there are 60 plus file systems in the Linux kernel tree. Right? Now the only problem is you may need to test them all, um, but a lot of those file systems are actually very specialized. Right? I mean, you, you, know, you wouldn't use some of these file systems, they're not even necessarily feature complete. Um, but you know, if you look around the main ones, you know, you've got ButterFS, XFS, EXT4, uh, you know, perhaps there are one or two others that you would include in that set. Um, you know, maybe maybe Riser of S4, although that's not actually not in tree at the moment, and I don't think there's any real uh, maintenance for that at this point. There were some people in Russia that were actually trying to keep Riser of S4 alive, but uh, I don't know how uh, hard they've been working at that. Um, so you know. I think one of the reasons why that myth had survived for so long is the other little secret about file system benchmarks is that most of the time it may not matter. Because with many, many different workloads, the file system doesn't actually end up being the bottleneck. Right? So for a lot of cases, it just won't matter. I mean, it's great there are lots of people who are really passionate about, my file system is better than your file system. But for a lot of use cases, it just doesn't matter. Right? Because you know, performance is actually not the main constraint. Right? I actually believe that in many cases, you should be making that decision based on other things. Right? If you need certain features, like say file system level snapshots, maybe that's a really good reason to use ButterFS. Maybe you like the very mature, robust user space tools. Right? That's one of the advantages EXT4 has. These things have nothing to do with performance, because with many workloads, Performance actually isn't the issue. Um, you know, and also file systems were a lot simpler back then. You know, we haven't added a lot of the new features that people want, you know, like extents, like punch hole. Um, and so, you know, with fewer features, it was actually a lot easier to make something be completely general purpose. Um, and then along with the fact that with many workloads, you know, file system wasn't the stress, way back when servers were actually really inefficiently run, right? I mean, you know, there have been lots of studies, you know, going back 10 years about your average machine was loaded to like maybe 10 or 20 percent if you were lucky. Um, I think these days we're doing a much better job of efficiently using our iron, um, and so that, that may be less true. But, you know, as a result, you know, it didn't really matter, right? But I actually believe that, you know, what you really want is, you know, horses for horses, choose the best file system for the job, and that may mean that you need to experiment, and that's good. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some future work that's going on uh, with EXP4 um, before we uh, end and leave time for uh, questions. Um, so I've already talked about weight stripe awareness and the fact that uh, that, that may be useful for EMMC devices. Um, <clears throat> there's also been some interesting work that I've been discussing with people um, about ways that we might actually make allocation decisions differently 
if we know that we're on an eMMC device. Uh, it turns out that SSDs actually have a lot of complexity in them uh, so that they look like real hard drives that are really fast. Um, and that's because with SSDs, the assumption was you couldn't change the operating system. Right? You, know, you were running on Linux, you were running on Windows. Windows was going to do what Windows did. Linux was going to do what Linux did. You know, Windows, for the longest time, because everyone was still using Windows XP, um, had every single partition offset by 63 sectors. Right? So your partitions weren't even aligned. Uh, and so modern SSDs actually will work well on Windows XP because they will actually allow writes to be completely misaligned because Windows XP, by definition, would misalign every single write to your partition. Right? So SSDs actually did a lot of that work to hide about, hot paper over some of the faults in the operating systems. MMC, MMC, e MMC devices are cheap because they're, they're going to be manufactured in the millions to be put in cell phones. Um, and so they don't have some of that um, smarts. And so one of the things we're thinking about doing is actually marking in the super block, this is going to be on a dumb flash device that has a primitive flash translation layer and so therefore we should make certain decisions that might actually be worse from a fragmentation point of view but would align everything on erase blocks because that's actually critically important on EMMC devices and that's okay because most EMMC devices aren't huge right so we can actually afford to you know maybe trade off fragmentation for better performance on these devices so you know those so those are some of the things that we're talking about doing some of these are, I'll steal some really good ideas from F2FS, which is the Samsung Flash Optimized File System. I don't mind stealing ideas when I can you know, get good ideas from other places. Uh, this is some research work uh, that's being done um, by Karen Stelly and Stan Park um, at HP and Stanford. Um, and they're basically over using the journaling layer um, in ext 3 to actually uh, provide transaction atomic MSIC. Uh, and the basic idea is you can actually do all sorts of work in a heap uh, and then do an atomic M-sync that, that would hit disk in an all or nothing fashion. Uh, and their theory is this may be a better way of doing things uh, because that way for a lot of application programmers they won't actually need to do anything other than use the standard Java or C++ data structures. Everything would be on the heap and then you do an atomic M-sync, flush it all to disk. I don't know if anything will come of that, but they're doing some interesting research and you know, we'll see where that goes. I've been kind of helping them out, it's kind of cool stuff. Um, final point I want to leave you with is it's not just about the file system, right? Uh, when you want to optimize an application, you need to think about optimizing the entire storage stack. Um, which means, you know, what functionality do you do in the block device layer? Um, and also optimizing uh, user space. One of the interesting things about F2FS, the flash optimized file system that Samsung has been working on, was a lot of the work that they did was based on the fact that SQLite has some really, really stupid write patterns. Um, and the people who did F2FS were from the flash division of Samsung. So they assumed that SQLite couldn't be modified and in fact would be a constant fixed point. So they designed a file system around SQLite basically to make for faster Android benchmarks. Um, which is interesting, like I said, they expose some really interesting good ideas, um, but it may very well be that the better solution is to optimize SQLite. <laughs> right? And so this is one of those things, right? which is sometimes the answer is not to optimize the file system, it's to optimize the user space on top of the file system. Um, and you know, it's just something to remember, right? Um, and one of the things that this may require is that we need to have better abstractions up and down the storage stack, right? Maybe applications need to be sending hints down to the file system, and maybe the file system needs to be sending hints to the block device, in particular for flash devices. And that's one of the things that we're still having conversations with the flash vendors about. So that's just some really cool stuff that's been going on. Um, hopefully people found this interesting. I personally find it really, really exciting. Um, and so with that, thank you all very much. some time for questions and there's a mic that can be going around. I'm going to take advantage of my, my yeah. position.
with the mic. And I just ask a, a few questions to sure. start out. Uh, one, you, you mentioned large versus small, and I think from, from the beginning of the presentation to the end of the presentation, probably the definition of, of large and small have changed in all of those things. Do you sort of quantifiers of what you think of as large and small today versus maybe 10 years ago? <coughs> um, so the sweet spot, as far as Peak 4 has been concerned, has been um, the largest single disk file system. Uh, single disk device that's made available, right? So these days we're starting to see four terabyte disks become available. Um, and so I've done a bunch of work very, very recently so that FSDK would, you know, uh, minimize the amount of CPU that would be needed on a very large four terabyte disk. Um, and this, these were issues that weren't particularly important five to ten years ago when we were only talking about, you know, one terabyte disks or, you know, even half terabyte disks. So in general, over time, that sort of changed, but a lot of our optimizations has really been on, you know, what's the big, biggest single disk file system that you can have. Um, and that's sort of like what Linux does, right? I mean, Linus has always said that he really optimizes for the sweet spot, which in practice has been, you know, how many cores do, can you put on a single socket, right? Because the vast majority of machines out there, for cost reasons, have a single CPU socket. And these days, you know, you might have Eight, eight cores on a socket. You know, Intel keeps talking about 32 cores on a socket. And so for scalability, we see the same thing, right? Which was, for a long time, you know, Linus basically said, well, you know, one CPU is what we're gonna optimize for, we'll support more, but the vast majority of people had one CPU, you know, one core, right? That became two cores and four cores. And so that's one of the things that happens over time is we kind of like gradually push upwards um, what we might consider normal, right? And then beyond that is what I'll consider large. So the second question I have, just, I'm sorry, I do have a couple. The other one is with, with the bypassing journal index for, yeah. what sort of performance speedups do you see? And I imagine that also tends to push your, uh, your uh, uh, FISC uh, work as well, because I imagine that you need to use it more than most people do in that capacity. But I'm really curious when you're talking about the, uh, the Samsung team having to uh, optimize uh, for SQLite, I've seen more and more of the sort of open source, uh, large uh, distributed uh, database kind of things. I'm more familiar with Cassandra working as much as they can with the operating system, which really means the file system, to try to optimize write patterns with the file system. Um, right. Do you look at those things like, you know, I'm thinking about your, your your journal mode with the pattern of large single file writes and the tens or twenties of gigabytes uh, files for these things. Uh, journal versus no journal seems like a huge win, but. Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the biggest reasons why uh, the journal becomes a problem for us uh, is not so much the performance hit, although the performance hit is there, how much it is really depends on what you're doing. Um, basically, F-Syncs require doing a full journal commit, so if you're doing lots of F-Sync operations, uh, the journal is going to really hurt. On the other hand, if you're doing lots of F-Syncs, you actually probably care about all the data reliably being on disk. Um, for us, I think one of the big things that really, really is a concern is um, worst case latency, right? 99th percentile latency. Uh, and this is really a big deal anytime you have a distributed system, right? And so, you know, it's one of the things, it's one of those little deep secrets people don't necessarily think about, you know, when the IBM salesperson rolls up and talks about SOA, right? You know, service oriented architecture, you know, where a single transaction is going to touch a hundred different machines. Right, which means there are a hundred different points of failure, but it also means there are a hundred different possible places where if one of the servers is a little bit slow, it slows down the internal, the entire SOA transaction. Right? And if you, the more machines you have, the more that even a one in 10,000 probability um, slowdown in a particular uh, latency uh, for a particular disk operation, you might have multiple machines that will, you know, hit that one in 10,000th case, um, and then the, the user basically sees this horrible user experience because every once in a while, things get really, really slow because multiple machines happen to be doing a journal commit at the wrong time for that one transaction. Um, and so that's actually one of the big things is, you know, if you're gonna be doing this thing very often, uh, you know, if you're doing some sort of like web-related thing, latency is actually really, really critical. Um, and so the journal was actually really, really bad from that perspective. As far as uh, 
how much time it takes. Um, as I said, it used to take 45 minutes to do an FSCK, and you know, if you're doing a cluster file system where you've got other servers who can take up the slack while the machine is rebooting, you know, 45 minutes was not great, but it was something you know that people could live with. Uh, when we moved over to EXP4, it basically went down to four minutes, right? Um, and this is actually one of the other things, right? Which is, if you instead of using a huge RAID array, you just simply have you know a large number of disks hooked up to a server, all as separate standalone disk volumes. We can FSCK all those disks in parallel, right? So you know you could have a dozen or more disks attached to a server. If they're all single disk file systems, you can run the FSCK in parallel on those different disk spindles, which means you know you could have lots of disks. It's still only going to be say five minutes to FSCK them all. Um, and so yeah, it's you know something that if you're using a cluster file system, you've got robustness uh, against individual servers dying. Um, the FSK time isn't really an issue. And so, so you were first uh, yeah. question. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, I have two questions, but they're really fast. Um, my favorite EXT4 feature that you didn't list was how fast it can format disks. Why? Ah, OK. Uh, so one of the features that we actually added in EXT4, it wasn't actually in the initial versions, but it's something that's now in, in some of the newer kernels is something called lazy inode table initialization. Um, and so what we do is we do not actually zero the entire inode table when we make a fest of the file system. It turns out it's not strictly necessary um, because we also have uh, checksums uh, on the block group descriptors so we know how much of the inode table is actually valid. However, if those checksums fail, FSCK doesn't know how much the inode table is valid and so we'll actually scan the entire inode table. If it turns out that portions of the inode table contain inodes from a previous file system, then FSCK can get really, really confused. Um, so what we do now is we do a lazy ta uh, inode table initialization so that after you mount the file system, after the first mount, it will be zeroing the inode tables in the background. So we're still doing the same amount of work, it's just that the MegaFest portion of it is fast. Um, one of the things that you can do is, if you care about making the installer um, experience quick, is while the installer mounts the file system, you can suppress the lazy inode table initialization. Sooner or later, you really do want to pay the piper and run the FSCK in the, in the background. If you're in a performance critical environment where you care about latency, you may want to disable that so you actually really do zero the entire inode table at format time. And that's an option, right? So, but for a lot of use cases, you know, zeroing the inode table in the background works just fine. Great. Um, uh, just one other question. Um, is there any plans or any talk about moving the journal to other devices, like having a secondary block device just for the journal? Um, so the question was uh, about supporting an external journal. That support is actually already in both ext 3 and ext 4 It is possible to have an external journal uh, the piece that's not actually there is uh, making FSCK do something intelligent if the journal device happens to be missing. All right. Uh, we also actually have support so that in theory you can actually put multiple file systems, use the journal for multiple file systems on a single journal device. The kernel code for that is there. What a lot of what's missing is the support code so that if the journal, journal device happens to be missing or one of the drives that is using that journal device isn't there when you want to do the replay, how do you save that journal somewhere else so that you can replay it back when that disk reappears? Um, and so the feature is there. No one has actually cared enough to actually finish all the polish that would be needed so it would be easy for anyone to use. I have heard of a few people playing with that where they would manually set up a flash device to use as the journal um, to speed up journal mode. Um, but you know, it's not been something where we've gotten the development community sufficiently excited about that to basically finish off that work. Most of it's there, it's just sort of the last 10% that's missing. Um, all right, I'm gonna go close again. Uh, you mentioned there was a lot of default 
options for EXT for that aren't enabled when you create the file system. Are any of them, uh, I'm assuming that a lot of them you can do at, at after the file system has been created. Are any of them, you have to do at creation time and you can't go back without um, initializing it? At this point, all the defaults that are enabled if you are creating an EXT4 file system from scratch um, can actually be enabled after the fact. The one big one that can't at this point is the 64-bit feature mode. Okay, it's because the 64-bit feature mode doubles the size of a whole bunch of fields, and so you actually have to enable that up front. Um, we enable that right now by default if you are creating a file system that requires 64 bits, um, or you know, it's too big for a 32-bit block number. We are not enabling that by default on smaller file systems. It's something we've thought about doing because um, we have run into a few cases where someone has created a file system on a uh, you know, 15 terabyte rate array and then they suddenly want to make it 30 terabytes and then they slam into that limit. Um, so that's one of those things that we're thinking about enabling by default. Uh, MakeFS has a makefs.conf file, um, which actually is very, very powerful. It allows you to basically set policy defaults, including some of these feature flags. Um, and it's not hard-coded in the MakeFS binder. So, if, you know, for example, if you wanted to make it be the case that 64-bit mode is enabled by default whenever you make a file system, you can just simply edit makefs.conf to add that feature. Right? And so what will happen is over time, when we're confident that a feature is really, really bulletproof, we just simply modify makefs.conf to add that in as the default. Okay, I saw two hands up before. I'm gonna, um, or three now. I'm gonna yeah. cut off at these three, uh, so we can get to the end of that. Q&A. Uh, sorry, down with the Q&A, on with the raffle. That's it. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Uh, just some information. Um, I have an ice cream sandwich device mm -hmm. that uses uh, MTP to hook yep. up to it. Mm -hmm. So, um, if they put that MTP code right into the kernel, if you hooked it up, it would hook up right away, right? Yeah, MTP, MTPFS is available as a fuse driver um, because it actually needs to talk to the USB device. And so uh, at the moment, it's basically a fuse, a fuse, fuse hookup. Yes. Um, I don't know of anyone who is working on trying to move MTPFS into the kernel. But if they um, did, it would, it would hook up right away, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it turns out that if you're willing to set up, I expect that in the future, distros will basically configure you know, the appropriate USB auto mount so that when you plug in an Android device, it automatically will mount MTPFS. Uh, there are instructions on the web that will actually tell you how to do it um, no, on your particular Linux device. distro. Uh, yeah. It requires a fair amount of, you know, magic strings and config files that you have to update. No, I have my tablet up to my computer. Yeah. I just had to follow the instructions that work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I was just doing a little bit of research during your talk to see what the status of NFS v4 ACLs was, or I guess now the sort of neutral term is rich ACLs. Um, any ideas to when that is sort of going to become mature or you know, usable by the general population? Um, to be honest, I haven't really been following NFS v4 all that closely. Uh, the people who care about it are typically people who need to interoperate with a Windows infrastructure. Um, for better or for worse, I've been fairly lucky in that in pretty much all the companies that I've worked for, that hasn't been a problem that we've had to worry about. Um, so I haven't had any personal reason to actually worry about it, so I unfortunately can't really answer. <laughs> okay, so the last question right here. Here's the mic. Physical erase, um, do you have tools for it? How, how, how do you do it, or can you not do it? Physical erase, as in uh, sending as in shred. OK, uh, so the, if you trust the disk to do that, there's a security erase command that you can send the disk that will ask it to basically wipe it. Um, and uh, use the htparm command to actually send that. Uh, there are many people who don't necessarily trust the disk's security erase to actually do a good enough job. And so, you know, those are the people who will take the disks and physically shred it or, you know, do whatever. No, I, I mean file level. Uh, file level, uh, so file level overwrite. 
Um, if you care about that, I think the best way to do it for now is the user space utilities that will just simply do a physical rewrite of the, the sectors multiple times. Um, realistically speaking, if a single overwrite pass or maybe multiple overwrite pass isn't good enough for you, you probably want to do physical destruction of the, the platter, right? Um, so there hasn't been a lot of interest in actually adding that support to the file system. Uh, we had that support originally in ext2 where we just simply do a single pass erase with zero bytes. Uh, that got removed with ext3 and there just hasn't been a lot of interest to add it to ext4. If someone sent me the patch I'd probably take it if it was clean. Um, but I'm not sure how many people would actually really care quite honestly. Um, but yeah, I mean, in theory you could do that. Uh, I suspect that what a lot of applications will actually do is they'll just simply store the data encrypted on disk, uh, and then they just simply shred the key. Um, so it may very well be that that's another example of we could add the complexity to the file system, but the application may actually be a better place of doing that, right? Because the problem with doing it in the kernel is you actually have to worry about key management. Right, because you know you probably want to actually have multiple different keys that get used um, for encrypting data that's stored at rest, um, and so I personally believe that's something that's better done in user space uh, than in the kernel. But you know, reasonable people can disagree on that. They certainly have in the past. Um, okay, I think we're ready for the uh, quiz questions, uh, which uh, oh. Ted picked yeah. down. Um, okay, and uh, this is the first one. From, now, let's. Do, do you want to start with the book first or the uh, e-book giveaways first? Uh, whoever wins first. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, all right. All right. I got it. All right, there we go. All right. Sorry, I didn't. No, all right. I well, hand up first. I should have waited before. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to go here. Uh, so I'm going to go for people who are with the organization. Oh. So, uh, so, there you go. 2001? Uh, yes. All right, and you would prefer uh, uh, you could either credit from O'Reilly ebook or the uh, like 50 pound book. <laughs> yeah, all right, we're going to the best. There you go. All right, next question. All right, ready? Congratulations. And write a review if you can for it. Like, let the publishers know if you like it. Uh, oh my god, uh, you're all here. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the middle, middle left this time. Uh, in the green shirt is? 2007. 2007? Yes. Alright, there you go. And, uh, close. Alright. Next? Okay. We have about two more here. Okay. Yep. Radio watch, because you know, people are here are like getting them really quickly. I can't even see the question. All right, uh, sorry, you're going to go first. You're already, you're already one, you're... <laughs> 2006, yes. I right. would have also accepted 2003, but, yeah. Okay. I'm going to keep everyone, uh, sorry, the big room. I'm going to go over here and look for the first hand. Sorry if uh, I don't see you. Okay. Uh, what is the maximum theoretical file sizes for ext3 and ext4? Oh. <laughs> file system size. All right, who's up? Um, right here? <laughs> what, what's your answer? Four terabytes. Four terabytes? Uh, no, and I want it for ext 3 and ext 4 All right, um, I have a vigorous hand maybe over here in the back of the blue shirt. 32 terabytes and one exabyte. That's correct. Uh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> We're running a little late, we should probably have everyone here at the camp. So, go and hope you enjoyed the presentation.